international lawyer that has been specializing in European human rights law for 30 years. On June 11, 2011, he was appointed, uh, elected United, Na United Nations National Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights. He is a judge of the residual mechanism for the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and former Yugoslavia. And certainly within the UK, he had uh, an, uh, an incredible career at the bench. He's one of the 10 best silks uh, in the country, a leading presence in the field of human rights. He has been master of the bench of the Middle Temple, a fellow of Mansfield College at Oxford. He's also an independent legal advisor to the UK Parliament Standards and Privileges Committees. And he's had very famous clients, including the former Prime Minister of Kosovo and Julian Assange. And I think I, the other part I think of his career and his charisma and his dedication to the field of human rights, he brings to it not only his incredible uh, stamina, his incredible intelligence, his wit, but also I think his sense of realism. And I think we are so honored to have him here. One of the last things that was said about him is that he has, he has the ability to put together fantastic package of ideas. And indeed, I think we are so grateful and so honored that he made a stop to Canada to come and speak to us. Merci. I'd like then, obviously, to begin by thanking the CCLA, uh, the Canadian uh, Arab Institute, and the faculty for the opportunity to be here and to uh, say some uh, uh, opening to give some opening remarks in this I important conference reviewing uh, the social and political cost of the last decade of counter-terrorism initiatives in Canada. I always think that uh, in tackling some of the difficult questions of policy that arise in the counter-terrorism context, it's helpful to pause and remember where we started from and how we got to where we are now before deciding where we go next. And that inevitably brings us back uh, to the events of 9-11. In the years immediately following the attacks on New York, Washington and Pennsylvania in 2001, the protection of human rights and the rule of law was all but forgotten in the rush to implement unprecedented security measures right across the globe. Canada was by no means unique in this respect and by no means the worst offender. In what has been rightly described as a paradigm shift in state rhetoric and practice, the protection of human rights was swiftly, shockingly, quickly sidelined as a dispensable luxury. This was a tidal wave uh, of panic legislation in different states around the world, which has caused incalculable and lasting damage to the entire architecture of international human rights law. It's through the prism of national security and the interface between national security and the rule of law, that is where the rubber hits the road. Government officials and policy makers, particularly, uh, it has to be said, in the liberal democracies, uh, started to claim that the rules had changed, uh, or they just invented new rules of international law of entirely dubious provenance, like the so-called global war paradigm relied upon by US officials, which I'll come back to in a, in a few moments. These policymakers dismissed as unrealistic calls from lawyers, from rights groups, um, for adherence to certain basic minimum standards in confronting this new global threat. Rights, they said, just got in the way of effective protection uh, and security uh, at a time of what was perceived to be national and international 
uh, emergency. Uh, uh, over time, nearly a, well, more than a decade, uh, as the dust has very gradually come to settle, more mature reflection has been brought to bear on some of these problems. In states uh, like Canada, uh, with a, a genuinely independent judiciary and a commitment to the rule of law, there have been successful and quite bold legal challenges to some of the worst executive excesses. The United Kingdom is similar. The judiciary uh, uh, surprisingly showed themselves to be robust uh, in holding the executive within reasonable limits in trying to shift the relationship between the individual and the state. The international community has come very gradually to accept, at least formally, that it is only by adherence to international human rights standards that counter-terrorism strategies can ultimately succeed. Respect for the rule of law isn't just a question of legitimacy in this context, because legitimacy is an immovable feast on which opinions differ, but respect for the rule of law is in fact, a question of effective prevention, effective counterterrorism. Because experience has shown over the last decade that human rights abuse by states in their counterterrorism strategies has become one of the most effective means of spreading support for terrorist organizations and resort to armed force. So far from reducing or eliminating uh, the threat of terrorism, uh, the adoption of human rights abusive counter-terrorism policies uh, it, it has been shown over and over again uh, to increase uh, the risk uh, to which uh, populations are subjected. Forgive me for sort of swigging from the bottle, but there aren't any cups up here. Um, the, the theme of my remarks this morning is the role which is played by the UN in the learning process that's taken place over the last uh, decade. As an intergovernmental organization with an asymmetrical power dynamic, it might be expected that the UN would replicate or at the very least endorse um, the patterns of thought, of misthought, that underlay uh, the responses of states in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And um, regrettably, to some extent, that would be a fair criticism. Um, but in the decade or so since then, a human rights component, which was conspicuously absent from UN initiatives at the outset, has slowly but purposefully found its way onto the UN's counter-terrorism agenda and is now an inherent and integral part uh, of its work. I'm just sketching the framework uh, in, in, a, in a few sentences. Uh, under the UN Charter, as you know, um, it's the primary function of the Security Council to promote and maintain international peace and security. Uh, and for that purpose, it has a range of powers available to it under Chapter 7 of the Charter, including the power under Article 41 to impose sanctions on states, on non-state entities, and increasingly on individuals. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the Council, which had already recognized that acts of terrorism represented a threat to international peace and security, ramped up, under pressure from the United States, its counter-terrorism initiatives very dramatically and began to establish the elements of what has now become a permanent counter-terrorism apparatus operating uh, at the international uh, level. And as with the national measures that were adopted in haste and repented uh, sometimes at leisure, some of the changes that were implemented by the UN um, were uh, better thought out 
than others, as, as, as we'll see. The core Security Council resolution is Resolution 1373, adopted in 2002, which imposed a series of binding obligations on all member states to criminalise a range of conduct associated um, with uh, uh, terrorism as nationally defined, including and extending to terrorist financing, to freeze the assets of terrorist organisations and those associated with them, and to impose criminal penalties reflecting the gravity uh, of the crimes. It became, in other words, an international legal obligation. And this was the first time that the Security Council had ever imposed a mandatory obligation on member states to change their own domestic criminal law. M many states, probably most states, um, uh, reacted because there was not just the resolution itself, but a, 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 an executive, which I'll describe in a moment, which, whose job it was to ensure that states did what they were required to do. Uh, and many states reacted by introducing either new or special uh, forms of national security legislation, often at very great speed and with minimal legislative scrutiny uh, or debate. And initially, th there was little, if any, mention at all of human rights or the rule of law in any of the initiatives that were promulgated at the UN level from 1373 uh, uh, um, uh, 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 onwards. But by 2003, the Security Council had started to change its language a little. And in Resolution 1456, it included for the first time a provision that requires states to ensure that any measures they take to combat terrorism must comply, and there's the rubric, with their obligations under international law and in particular international human rights, humanitarian and refugee law. That is the language which has then been replicated in virtually every uh, other resolution and general assembly resolution uh, since then. I mean, it, it's perhaps surprising that it should have taken three years um, for the UN to even start to wake up to the issue that, that human rights might have uh, an important role to play in mediating uh, and circumscribing counter-terrorism measures. The promotion and protection of human rights is, after all, one of the core functions of the UN and is set out in Article 1 of the Charter uh, on an equal footing with the UN's responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. And as the former Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, uh, was fond of saying, respect for the rule of law lies at the very heart uh, of the UN's mission. But it is that apparent tension between security and human rights, counter-terrorism and the rule of law that has be, been allowed to polarise opinion within uh, communities, within states uh, and between UN member states uh, at the international level. A polarisation which over the last decade has delayed the development of a meaningful consensus on how international law should, can uh, respond to the threat of terrorism consistent with uh, adhering uh, to fundamental international standards. It's all very well, some would say, for the Security Council to adopt high-sounding statements of principle, but the practices of states have failed to follow uh, their commitments. To many, the formulation that was adopted in Resolution 1456 and has been repeated in virtually every resolution since is, is little more than boilerplate language 
devoid of, of meaningful content and, and ringing hollow whilst states, including permanent members of the Security Council, continue to flout basic constitutional principles such as effective judicial review of executive detention without trial, the prohibition on torture, reliance on evidence obtained by torture, intelligence sharing with states known to practice torture, uh, and the introduction of open-ended emergency provisions derogating from their obligations under international human rights treaties. A very large number of liberal democracies have enacted legislation which comes within one or more of those categories, including Canada, including the United Kingdom, including the United States, including Australia. Now, the process of reform at UN level didn't begin, I mean, despite the language, the linguistic change, didn't begin in earnest until 2006 when the General Assembly adopted the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy. That was intended to be the first comprehensive international statement uh, of obligations resting on states to combat terrorism and promote international cooperation, but within a rule of law framework. And for those of you who don't know it, pillar four of the strategy sets out specific rule of law guarantees, uh, but that the requirement for human rights protection underpins the strategy as a whole. It is a it's single, agreed, General Assembly adopted global strategy which aims to mediate between the supposedly competing interests of national security and the rule of law by emphasising that these are not competing imperatives, but complementary ones. Now, while that process was ongoing and the strategy was under negotiation, the Human Rights Commission, as it then was, established the mandate of Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights, and that's the mandate that I, I now hold. So as one of the Human Rights Council's uh, so-called special procedures, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights operates under the auspices of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in, in Geneva, uh, and I'm required to report every six months in rotation to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council on a thematic issue relevant to the mandate to liaise with all of the UN's counter-terrorism bodies, including those established directly under the Security Council, and to, quote, provide technical and other advice to states through country visits and other forms of dialogue. What that really means is monitoring states' compliance with their obligations. Um, the central priority of my mandate uh, is to maintain as close a watch as possible on practices adopted by states and sometimes by the UN itself that undermine international standards in the prevention, investigation, prosecution and punishment of those accused of acts of terrorism, as well as a range of executive and sometimes even military measures taken at a national and international level to suppress uh, terrorism. Um, I, I, I made it clear when I took over the mandate last year um, that whilst that was and always would be the core priority, um, I also intended to ensure that proportionate attention was paid to the human rights of the victims of terrorist acts. Um, and I just want to say one or two words on that subject um, uh, before turning to some of the other uh, uh, more pressing issues because I, I don't believe that one can sensibly begin talking about human rights in this context without recognising the human tragedies that lie beneath the statistics. And my first thematic report to the Human Rights Council set out an international framework for protecting and promoting the rights of direct and indirect victims of terrorist crime, including uh, their rights to protection and to uh, compensation and rehabilitation. But at the core of the framework principles um, was the simple proposition, still uh, surprisingly disputed by some states and by many international human rights NGOs, uh, 
uh, that all acts of terrorism in which civilians are killed or seriously injured amount to gross human rights violations. Uh, it, it's my belief, leaving the technicalities and the legality uh, arguments aside, that human rights law needs broadly to conform with the views of the women and the men around the world whose rights it exists to protect. Uh, that is the source of its legitimacy. And if one were to ask any woman or man in any capital city, in any country in the world, whether the mass killing of innocent civilians in a terrorist attack is a human rights violation, they would think that the answer was obvious. And indeed, as Amnesty International uh, has recognized, some uh, such acts can properly be characterized as crimes against humanity, but not apparently, according to Amnesty, as human rights violations. Um, that is not a view which I think can last for very much longer as a distinction. The importance of this point is this, and that states have not just a moral but a legal obligation to protect the lives of their citizens and those within their jurisdiction. And indeed, it can be said that that is the primary obligation of the state, <clears throat> or even the very raison d'etre for statehood. We shouldn't mince our words in this debate. Effective counterterrorism is in itself a human rights obligation resting on states constructive dialogue with policymakers on the protection of human rights in countering terrorism begins with that truism, that effective lawful counter-terrorism is a human rights obligation that states must discharge. But it doesn't end with that truism. Protecting the rights of the victim and the potential future victims of terrorism doesn't mean, of course, infringing the rights of those accused or suspected of involvement uh, in, in acts of terrorism. However trite that proposition may uh, uh, um, have come to sound nowadays, <clears throat> it remains the central axiom for any comprehensive counter-terrorism strategy. Effective national security and protection of human rights genuinely are not competing, but complementary imperatives. In drafting the framework principles for victims, I, I consulted very widely with organizations representing uh, victims of terrorism and with the victims directly themselves. And I, and I can tell you that their call is not for more human rights abuse on their behalf, not for more waterboarding or torture more secret detention or executive detention without trial. That's not what the victims want. Their call is for accountability for the right to truth achieved through open, fair and transparent ordinary criminal procedures in which evidence is fairly and openly adduced and the proceedings respect the rule of law so that their outcome can be relied upon. The positive statements of principle by the General Assembly and the Security Council have to be turned from mere rhetoric into real practice. They have to become part of the way policymakers think. Let me just give you a practical example of what I mean by that. The right to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law is a right that we as lawyers traditionally regard as a right belonging to an accused person in criminal proceedings. But it is just as much a right that belongs to the victim. Indefinite executive detention or a secret trial where the victims get to know nothing of the evidence, or where convictions or executive measures are based upon unreliable accounts elicited by torture committed by the agents of a foreign state, for example. Each of these distortions, in their different way, 
amount to a denial of the victim's basic right to truth and accountability, just as much as they amount to a denial of the rights of the uh, individual suspected or accused. Uh, and to my mind, it's ensuring that you, we, we can get across the notion that these are not competing but complementary uh, um, uh, dynamics, imperatives. Get, across, get it across in a way that is real rather than purely theoretical. Uh, that is the only way constructive engagement is going to take us forward so that we can start to rebuild some of the foundations of international law that have been so badly damaged. I've got an eye on the clock. Um, <clears throat> do you, does, does somebody want to give me some idea of when you'd like me to go on to or when you'd like me to stop? I, mean, I know we, we, we slipped, slipped a little bit, so. Well, we've been late a little bit, so starting 10 more minutes. Fine. Um, I'll just dash through some of the other things I wanted to say to you then. Um, <laughs> No, no, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Um, all right, so, so, so in 2010, finally, the Security Council in Resolution 1963 finally recognises in terms that terrorism will not and cannot be defeated by military or law enforcement or security or intelligence measures alone. In other words, that it is necessary to address not just mechanisms of national security, but the conditions, as they are described, the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. And in that resolution, the Security Council, and it's quite a remarkable thing, recognises in terms that respect for the rule of law uh, and the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms are essential means of offering a viable alternative to those who could otherwise be susceptible to terrorist recruitment and radicalization. Now that's quite a, just, just pausing there for a moment. This is the Security Council talking. And what it's saying just two years ago is that it now accepts that it is necessary to tackle not only the manifestations of terrorism but also its causes. And in the process, it has acknowledged that respect for human rights is essential to effective prevention and that the reverse is equally true, that human rights abusive counter-terrorism policies increase the risk of terrorism. Now, for that to have reached the point at which it can be agreed as a resolution by the Security Council, um, it is, is um, to my mind, an extremely important development because we all know it's true. We all know that human rights abusive counter-terrorism increases the threat of terrorism. But understanding that as a driver behind policy is critical because instead of just appealing in the kind of polarised way that we've got stuck over the last decade to the higher-mindedness of policymakers, Instead of a competing moral soapbox between people saying, on the one hand, you know, there are certain rights above which uh, uh, you should never uh, put policy, and policymakers saying, to hell with your rights, we're saving lives here, we're actually beginning to realise that the two <laughs> genuinely reach, just as in the example of a fair trial for, for, for victims, they genuinely reach the same uh, destination. So just as, for example, in Northern Ireland, uh, the introduction of internment without trial turned the IRA from a fringe organisation with almost no popular support <clears throat> into a grassroots movement which could claim to be representing large sections of the nationalist community and which is now in government in Northern Ireland. In other words, internment, the use of indefinite internment without trial in Northern Ireland just totally changed the game and gave the IRA the degree of support it critically needed to become a major political force for constitutional change. So too, the photographs of Abu Ghraib 
and the official authorization of torture at Guantanamo Bay uh, and elsewhere have reverberated around the world as Clarion calls for terrorist recruitment. I'll be surprised. So much then for, for, for the approach that I take to, to the mandate and, for, uh, and to constructive engagement with policymakers. I want to turn now, if I can, briefly, just to one or two of the specific challenges that are among uh, <clears throat> the most pressing concerns that, that I have to deal with in the mandate. Um, the first, and I've touched upon it uh, already, is what I've described as the US global war paradigm, the proposition culled by lawyers and officials of the State Department under the Bush administration that since 9-11 the US and its allies have been at war with a stateless enemy and that accordingly its actions are to be judged by the laws of war uh, rather than the laws applicable uh, in peacetime, uh, the theatre of conflict being the entire globe. That was a policy change announced by the Bush administration, announced by President Bush himself, uh, within a couple of days of 9-11. Um, on, on September the 11th, he said, the enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country, and our war, it's quite, the words are important, our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it doesn't end there. It will not end, he said, until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. So this war will carry on until terrorism is no more. The idea that international terrorism of all forms is somehow capable of being definitively defeated and eliminated by military means seems with retrospect hopelessly naive as a suggestion for any policymaker. We've seen even in the last few months <clears throat> new forms of terrorism, new alliances forming in Libya, in other parts of North Africa, in Syria and elsewhere. It's a constantly moving form of, of low uh, intensity or medium intensity armed conflict spilling into areas which are not uh, conflict zones. No one now seriously believes that terrorism is a phenomenon capable of being defeated. It is a reality with which nations must contend permanently, which means that nations must devise permanent and lasting solutions consistent with the rule of law. <clears throat> but in the meantime, this global war paradigm has done immense damage to a previously shared international consensus on the legal framework underlying both international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Estimates suggest that thousands of people were detained by US forces as so-called enemy combatants, including the more than 800 detainees to have passed through the Guantanamo Bay detention facility, as well as many more who were detained uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, as well as at secret detention facilities in other states, including Poland, Romania, Lithuania, and many others, set up and run in coordination with the CIA's secret detention and renditions program. The war paradigm has always been based on the flimsiest of reasoning in, in common with, I think, the vast majority of international lawyers. It's one which I would reject uh, out of hand. It wasn't even supported at the time by the close allies of the United States. <clears throat> The first term Obama administration initially retreated from that approach. But over the past 18 months, it has begun to rear its head uh, once again in briefings by administration officials seeking to provide <clears throat> a legal justification for the drone program of targeted killing in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Uh, the best available figures 
suggest that at least 391 civilians have been killed in Pakistan alone and that 160 children are reported among the deaths. Uh, the uh, bureau responsible for the compilation of these statistics uh, also uh, alleges that since President Obama took office, at least 50 civilians <clears throat> were killed in follow-up strikes when they had gone to help the victims um, of uh, a, a primary drone strike and that more than 20 civilians have been attacked in deliberate strikes on funerals and mourners. My colleague Christoph Hines, the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary and Arbitrary Executions, has described such attacks, uh, if they prove to have happened, as war crimes, and that is a view uh, that I would endorse. Um, the real issue isn't so much which legal regime applies, but what actually is happening on the ground. Um, the uh, formal position of the Obama administration is that it continues to adopt a neither confirm nor deny position as to even the existence of the drone program, whilst allowing its officials to give briefings in which its supposed legality is purportedly justified in personal lectures and interviews. <clears throat> in reality, the administration is holding its finger in the dike uh, of accountability in the dam. There, there are now a large number of lawsuits in different parts of the world, including the UK, uh, Pakistan and the US itself, uh, through which pressure is mounting for investigation and accountability. And during the last session of the Human Rights Council in Geneva in June, many states, uh, including Russia, China and Pakistan itself, called for an investigation into the use of drone strikes as a means of targeted killing. When I was asked in the, in the exercise of my mandate by those states uh, to bring <coughs> forward proposals uh, on that issue, and I'm working closely uh, with Christoph Hines uh, on that subject. But, but first and foremost, um, from my point of view, uh, the issue is investigation. And I've therefore called on states using drone technology as a means of targeted killing to establish a system of truly independent investigation into the justification for the targeting and the proportionality of the actions taken. Because whichever legal regime applies, uh, the, issue, uh, it, uh, the issues of uh, targeting and proportionality uh, will fall to uh, be determined uh, on the facts. Um, in the first instance, it will be for those states using the technology or upon whose territory it is used to establish sufficiently robust and independent investigative procedures. And independence here means institutional independence from the bodies whose actions are in question. Um, but if the relevant states are not willing to do it, uh, then uh, my recommendation, and the work is already underway uh, to put the machinery in place, is that it will be necessary for the UN itself to conduct investigations uh, into each and every death. Uh, and that is a process, as I say, that if, uh, if movement uh, doesn't occur uh, pretty soon, uh, is likely uh, to uh, um, uh, be put into operation uh, over the next 12 months or so. The issue is moving very rapidly <clears throat> up the international uh, agenda. I wanted to say a little bit about accountability, but I, I'm afraid time doesn't permit it. Um, simply this. There's a fantastic um, uh, account of... Um, the, the accountability process in South America in a book um, called The Justice Cascade. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a marvellous um, uh, description of the process by which human rights prosecutions require there to be a kind of gathering of momentum of evidence before finally what seemed unthinkable 10 years ago when officials were committing crimes under particular regimes in the belief of their permanent impunity becomes a reality. That is starting to happen in relation to those involved with the CIA's torture, secret detention and renditions program. 
It's been 10 years of trying to get at the information, and I think many of us thought the moment had passed, and that's what everyone always thinks in these situations, until you know, there was an investigation conducted by my mandate in conjunction with uh, 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 the torture uh, 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 arbitrary detention and some ex-mandates, then the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe uh, and the European Parliament conducted their own investigations focusing on the collaboration of European states with the CIA secret detention and renditions program. And finally, we are at a point where two of the individuals who are currently facing the death penalty in military commission trials in Guantanamo and who alleged that they were detained and tortured in Poland and Romania on the way, have brought actions against Poland and Romania in the European Court of Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights has demanded from Poland and Romania a detailed explanation of the nature of its intelligence cooperation with the CIA. A prosecution has started of a public official in Poland Investigations are underway in Romania, uh, and uh, there is a stalled, um, temporarily one hopes stalled, investigation in Lithuania. Parliamentary investigations are ongoing. The story is just about ripe for breaking, which is positive when one thinks in terms of accountability. But from the point of view of, of, of my mandate, that has to be counterbalanced against the fact that we're now facing the extremely disturbing prospect that one of the two candidates in the US presidential elections has openly acknowledged his support for the use of waterboarding of terrorist suspects, including one of the two whose cases are before the European Court of Human Rights, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was waterboarded 182 separate times. A, a, a course of action that Mitt Romney has specifically endorsed. What that means is that if Romney is elected, he's going to be the first world leader in history to be able to claim a democratic mandate for torture because he's put it on the agenda in his election campaign. And the democratic mandate for torture is, for me, an even more troubling prospect than the clandestine executive authorization of torture uh, in the first place uh, by the Bush uh, administration. Um, can I just say one, uh, one deal with one uh, other uh, topic? I mean, I had a couple of others I wanted to touch on, but let me just touch on one uh, other uh, topic, if I may. Um, that is the use of executive measures of prevention. The, adoptive, the adoption of, of, of coercive powers over the individual available to the executive as a means of man managing an anticipatory risk. They can take a variety of forms from powers of executive detention without trial to decisions that involve the reform of individuals to states where they may be at risk of torture or, or of being subjected to a flagrantly unfair trial, right through to the listing of individuals on targeted terrorist blacklists and the freezing or, or forfeiture of their assets. Now, measures of that kind uh, are based on executive decision making, uh, typically depending on intelligence information that is not supplied in a form in which it can be presented as reliable evidence to a court. That might be because intelligence information is inherently difficult to evaluate according to traditional standards of proof, criminal or civil, or it may be because the state claims human or technical sources can't safely be revealed. The guiding principle from an international law point of view, uh, for the measures of that kind, is that they must be amenable to a fair judicial review. Domestic uh, administrative and judicial tribunals in a number of jurisdictions, including Canada and the United Kingdom, 
have now developed relatively sophisticated rules of procedure for scrutinising intelligence information uh, that the authorities are unwilling uh, to disclose to the subject, including closed evidence procedures, the appointment of security vetted special advocates, um, and, uh, and so forth. In, in Europe, the European Court of Human Rights has held that where judicial review of a measure of that kind is based solely or to a decisive extent on intelligence material that is not disclosed to the subject, uh, then the procedure falls short of the essential minimum standards of due process. And as a core irreducible minimum, the individual must be provided with sufficient information to enable uh, him or her to know the core allegations, including the closed allegations, and to give effective instructions both to uh, his or her ordinary advocate and to the special advocate in relation to the closed case. The UK has followed that approach um, uh, through judicial decision and as I understand the position in Canada uh, the changes brought about by the 2008 amendment to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act were at least designed to produce a similar uh, outcome. Other states around the world are looking to the Canadian British experience with a view to uh, seeing whether it provides a workable long-term model for judicial review of executive decisions based on intelligence that the state claims to be unable to disclose on national security grounds. So what do we think about that? I mean, I, I can tell you, I, I did many of these cases at the outset as an advocate, and it feels very uncomfortable to all of us to be participating in a system where some form of unfamiliar procedural adaptation creates the appearance that, well not just the appearance, the reality, that there is a form of secret justice taking place. But the critical vice always was the fact that the individual didn't know the case they had to meet. Now if that vice is capable of being overcome by ensuring that the individual is provided with sufficient particulars so that they have an clear understanding of the allegation they have to meet and if the state considers that, that uh, if, there, if there's information that the judge considers necessary to enable uh, that fair uh, disclosure to take place but which the state is still unwilling to disclose then the state must abandon reliance on that material then taken together those principles go quite some considerable way towards resolving the problem of the accused not knowing the case against him or her. Now, whilst those procedures have the appearance of secret justice, and whilst they represent a significant departure um, from inter partes adversarial proceedings, they do have one very significant advantage. And that is that properly and fairly administered they permit judicial supervision to take place where otherwise there would be none of executive decision making based on secret intelligence. In other words, they provide a means of testing intelligence information on which executive decisions are made and subjecting its reliability to judicial independent scrutiny. And to that extent, they are a model which is capable, if done properly, of increasing rather than undermining the accountability uh, of the executive. I may make it clear, I'm not blindly extolling the virtues of this. There are acute problems with it, and I'm, I'm very much alive to them. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the experience of the special advocates themselves um, uh, in both jurisdictions, but particularly in the UK where they've been operating on a much larger scale for a much longer time, um, attest to the shortcomings that have been identified and some of them remedied over the years. But by listening to the experience and concerns of the special advocate community, their suggestions, <clears throat> and by addressing and rectifying the shortcomings that they've identified, it is possible to improve these procedures to a point
at which they can become an a, a tool in the armory of, of human rights protection by securing judicial scrutiny of reliance on dubious, potentially dubious, uh, intelligence material, often obtained through questionable cooperation uh, with torturing uh, or ill-treating uh, states. Now, <clears throat> let me just say a word or two briefly about um, the reports that I've seen uh, and um, uh, my own um, uh, research in relation to uh, the, the information emerging about the case of Mohammed Majoub and the legislation uh, as it operates in Canada. And obviously these reports are emblematic of some of the problems that can attend executive measures uh, of this kind based on intelligence sharing with states known to practice torture. Uh, I, I've been following <coughs> the case fairly closely and it is um, inevitably a cause for serious concern that this man has been held in detention or house arrest for more than 12 years on the basis of evidence uh, which, according to the reports uh, I've received, uh, includes um, a, a certain amount of evidence, uh, as I understand it, the recent judgment confirms this, uh, obtained through torture by officials of the Mubarak regime in Egypt. It wouldn't be right for me uh, at this stage to go further and express conclusions about an individual case without first affording uh, the Canadian government a full opportunity to engage in constructive dialogue on the issues that have been thrown up by that case and by the ministerial directive uh, concerning uh, cooperation with torturing states. But I can just make four, if I may, short comments. Uh, the first is that if those reports are correct, <clears throat> this would not be the only case of which I am aware in which intelligence emanating from the Mubarak security services has been relied upon by other states only to discover subsequently that it was, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, marred by the use of torture. I'm aware of a number of such instances affecting states other than Canada in which action has been taken against individuals based on Mubarak uh, torture poison uh, material. Secondly, uh, there is no, as yet, clear international consensus on the circumstances in which intelligence and executive agencies may lawfully rely on information supplied by other states known to use torture. There is a spectrum of situations to consider. At one end of the extreme is the hypothetical ticking bomb scenario, the use of tainted evidence supplied by a foreign state in a situation of extreme urgency to avoid a catastrophic tragedy. And that's the one that's always emblematically used to justify then uh, 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 throwing away the baby with the bathwater. That is one, albeit very rarely encountered in practice, possibility. But the detention of an individual for more than a decade on national security grounds is, one might think, at the very opposite end of the spectrum of imminence and emergency that would justify suspending basic principles concerning the use of evidence obtained by torture. If states are to avoid allegations of complicity in torture, and of providing a market for the fruits of torture, then it is time uh, for states to agree clear standards to govern the circumstances in which it is lawful for emergency executive action to be taken in reliance on such information in order to avert an imminent catastrophe. And I'm working together with my colleague Juan Mendez, the Special Rapporteur on Torture, in an attempt to formulate some principles on that uh, difficult and contentious subject. Third point, by contrast, there is an absolute international legal prohibition on the use 
uh, of such information as evidence in any judicial proceedings. And that, uh, as you well know, is enshrined in Article 15 of the UN Torture Convention. But as I understand it, is also reflected in Section 83.1.1 of the Canadian legislation as amended. So long as there is an effective judicial review process, such as the one that's been carried out in Mr. Majub's case before Mr. Justice Blanchard in the federal uh, court, then the risk that evidence may have been obtained by torture should be investigated uh, and exposed with the result that the evidence is not in the end relied upon or, or, or the state is not permitted to rely upon it um, in the course of the proceedings, regardless of its apparently probative uh, value. Uh, in the course of such an investigation conducted by the court, the burden rests squarely on the state. If, the, if there's a plausible basis to investigate it, and the fact that it emanates from a state known to practice torture is such a plausible basis, then the burden rests upon the state to satisfy an independent judiciary that the evidence was not uh, so uh, obtained. And finally, um, may I just say this, the, the, the Canadian government is uh, aware of my concern uh, about Mr. Majub's case and uh, about the issues as reported it, uh, concerning the operation of the ministerial directive uh, and has already indicated its willingness to engage in constructive discussions uh, concerning uh, the issues that have been uh, highlighted and those are discussions that I will be uh, pursuing with the government uh, and I'm sure you'll understand that it wouldn't be right uh, for me to say any more about uh, these issues in a public forum until those discussions uh, have taken place. Um, I've run out of time, uh, but uh, uh, I'd like, if I may, just to thank you for your attention uh, and to wish uh, all of you well with the remainder of the conference.